In the early days coming up, I mean, you know, battling, uh, shoot, it requires the cap. I battled the first battle I had ever lost because I was the man in junior high school. First battle I ever lost was trying to battle AC alone to Mike and Nine at the, uh, at the, uh, Mardi Gras, man. That was the first battle I had ever lost, man. Them dudes were so good. This is what used to kill me. When you would battle them and you say your rhyme, they would tell you what words you was about to rhyme with that. Like, so you be in there trying to get it in, and they ended up saying your shit for you. And made you, and clowned you, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how advanced they was. I had never seen nothing like that, man. Battling with them, um, radio trying and them over there at Earl's Hot Dog Stand, you know, me and the L.A. Cool. We never really had a battle, but we was from different crews that associated with each other and stuff like that. Because my early years, my first rap group was called Bedrock Crew which was from West L.A., because, you know, you had the West L.A. crews, Bed Rock crew was my crew, then you had another crew, uh, TDF, Too Damn Fresh, which was associated with uh, Ice-T and stuff like that, because a lot of the MC and B-Boy that used to go down used to be at uh, Ultra Wave, and that's the late, you know, the late mid, the late 80s when Ultra Wave was popping, which was really a West Side thing. They used to have parties over at um, Veterans Auditorium, you know, that's when it used to really go down, and that's when the we had a lot of dance crews in L.A. where the cats used to wear the turtlenecks and the creepers with the tapered khakis, you know what I'm saying, and the, um, and the gravy sports jackets and stuff like that, you know. But uh, that's where a lot of those things used to come in at, man. Um, I really started getting into hard in the battle scene was like maybe early, I guess it was the early or mid-90s, man. Um, I won the battle at the Rap Sheet magazine. Their first battle that they took place, man, I was in that, and I actually won that battle. And a lot of prominent people that was in that one was like Exhibit was in that battle. Um, I think uh, uh, Elemento might have been in that battle. It was a couple of prominent dudes that was in that battle, man. You know what I'm saying? Back when Cats was battling over a beat, man, because I'm not too fond of this acapella. To me, acapella battling is like, it's like borderline cheating. But it's funny, me and AC was talking about it last night, and I put it in perspective like this. Those acapella battles that they're going on right now is like the equivalent to playing chess slow or playing on the clock. Playing on a beat, rhyming to a beat and battling over beat, that's like playing chess on the clock. That acapella stuff is like slow chess. You take, you know, it's going to take forever. You know what I'm saying? But that's the equivalent of it. And people, it's a market of it for it, man. But me, I just, you want to impress me, say that shit over a beat. <laughs> So Even those days, the hand. yeah, yeah, the hands, the hands, and yeah. we always yeah. had a beatbox. Like oh, to yeah, me, yeah, yeah. Hi in hip hop, that's one of the lost elements. That's funny now because I'm actually looking for a beatbox because I want to do some experimentation with a beatbox and see you know, what, what I could bring out of that, man. Because you got to think there was certain certain songs, man, that was beatbox, all beatbox, like Lottie Dottie's, all beatbox. A lot of some of that early um uh, uh, fat fat boy stuff all beatbox so to me even just ice latoya you see what i'm saying like there's some classic songs where it's done but it never went mainstream you know i wish beatboxing would have caught on like these motherfuckers on his auto tunes <laughs> what if beatboxing would have caught on like auto tunes <laughs> you know so that's my approach to it man you know but i guess that that's a a, a, a b a old b-boy's opinion you know it's you know uh, my parents wasn't too fond of my high top, so I ain't too fond of these dudes more. <laughs> the With the album. Movement X album, what it was, was is that we got, being inexperienced and being kids, we got caught up in a sucker move. And the sucker move was is that we were signed to Columbia through a production deal. So the production company put down that they were the producers, you know what I'm saying? Because to us, we didn't know what it was. To us, the producer was somebody that actually did the beat. But they came and approached us like, no, the producer is just somebody that put it together, you know, and Quincy Jones don't play all the instruments. He just brings everybody in. So musically, everything was done musically by my partner at the time, King Born. He did all the music and all the scratching. And the two songs that was produced by Lauren Chaney was I Deal With Mathematics and Freedom Got a Shotgun. So that's what that was, you know. But Randall and the guy Eckstein, and it's so funny because the guy who signed us to Columbia is Guy Eckstein, which is uh, 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 Eric Eckstein's son, the old jazz dude. You know, no, Benny, when it's done, it's not Eric Eckstein, it's uh, Benny uh, Eckstein, the old jazz dude from back in the day that used to mess with Miles Davis. Real crooner, pretty dude. It was his son, Guy, who actually signed us to Columbia. He was the A&R over there at the time. 
So, you know, we just got caught up in the swoop because it's so funny. Our manager doing the movement next time was Michael T. Williamson, which his claim of fame was, was Bubba Gump on Forrest Gump. He was Bubba. You know what I'm saying? So he was our manager because his thing was, you know, he was in the acting thing. He had a little bread. He wanted to reach back and do some hip hop. And he just didn't have the music experience. You know what I'm saying? So we got into different situations. Nothing that I fault him because Michael T. took care of us, man. He held us down. And he made sure that we got, I would have never gotten to that position without him. You know what I'm saying? So he, he definitely looked out, but it was just, it was just a lack of experience. You know, that's what it really is with a lot of people, man, when people don't get in this next position, it'd really be the lack of experience and not knowing what you should and shouldn't do, you know, because signing through a production deal with a label is like having a middleman. You know what I'm saying? And the reason why we ended up losing the deal at Columbia, because once we got hit the game and went to do the second album, we wanted to get him out, so a lot of our advance went to buy him out of the contract. Then we were so young and they felt inexperienced, they didn't trust us, trust us doing the album alone. So they made us live in New York to do the album, which was per diem, hotel, you know, not even mentioning the cost of the album. And eventually it just got over budget to the point where they never came out, man. But that second Movement X album would have been crazy, man. You we finished actually, it? Yeah, we finished it. I actually got it on tape in the garage, man. I just got it on a, on a cassette tape, and I think I got some ADATs and stuff like that. But the album was incredible, man. Let's put it out. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it out. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like one of those lost things, man. But then after that, when that... When the Movement X thing died down, I just started, you know, going around on the local circuit. Like I said, I won the MC battle. I was really hot on um, In The Good Life. You know, The Good Life was really where I honed my stage presence and my songwriting skills. Like, during The Good Life era, was that was probably the greatest learning experience was going through that, going through that chamber in my life, man. It was, it was, it was incredible because there was a lot of talented MCs that came out of The Good Life. You know, like I was explaining earlier to y'all, in L.A., there's two veins. You have the N.W.A. vein, where Snoop and all that other stuff comes from, the quote-unquote gangster rap. And then you have the underground vein, which really rides through the good life, you know. So, and that doesn't really get that. Nowadays, it's starting to get shine because you have people who's, uh, you know, historians that really want to know that history. So people are starting to come out now as different movies out and stuff like that and different people talking about it finally. But it never got no shine before, man underground real hard MC cats they used to really get it in back in the day uh, they had a book out man I think it's called a uh, uh, some type of greatest hip-hop list or something like that man and they got his song down there King Go Solo is one of the greatest DJ songs that ever came out you know amongst some other songs but I met King Born in high school when I came back from New York um, a guy named Tay and Tay is actually Tisha Campbell's from Martin's show, her little brother. He actually introduced me to King Born. And because uh, Tay used to, was beatboxing for me in a little battle and stuff like that. And King, you know, was around and we, we just ended up hooking up, you know what I'm saying? He was do, putting beats together on a little Dr. Rhythm drum machine back in the day. And that's how we started, man. We used to just really get it in. He was crazy on the turntables. We used to be at his family's garage out there in Ladera, man, and we just built the relationship up, man, and started doing songs. And, you know, people started hearing different connections and stuff like that, and it just really started to come together for us, man. And, you know, King went on to produce uh, the E. Rule projects, you know, that uh, Listen Up and Synopsis and stuff like that. So he went on to do his thing. And it's so funny because since I've changed my name from Lord Mustafa to Born on Law, and his name was King Born a Law. A lot of people confuse us, man. I'll be seeing discographies and they be giving me credit for the E Rule stuff. And I'll be like, yo, that's King Born, man. And I'm Born a Law. Like, and to us, it makes perfect sense. But to the world, it's like, no, it's the same. I've seen blogs and people arguing about it online that it was the same person. And I was like, really? Y'all don't get it? I mean, I'm a big, stocky dude. King is high yellow in. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all couldn't tell the difference and shit. You know, but I guess, you know, people get confused about the names. But amongst us and the gods, everybody always called, you know, King was like his middle name. People, Born was like his middle name. You know, nobody really called him that. They would always say King, and they would always call me Born. So it was funny how the confusion started, man. But King ended up doing his thing, man. He produced, um, you know, little projects and stuff because when, um, E. Rue was on Palace at the time. He did a couple of things for some other acts over there. I think like the Bushwhackers. I think he did all the, um, some early Supernatural stuff. 
He did the E Rule project, you know. He even did some demo stuff with uh, Ray J and shit. I remember going to the studio one time, he was fucking with Ray J. I was like, okay, homie. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, King doing his thing, though, man. He's he still, he still uh, making beats and stuff like that. And we, we've been talking about reconnecting and doing some new stuff, you know. But I work with E Rule all the time with my new group that I got out, Tabernacle MCs. We got a couple of joints with uh, E Rule, man. That's fire, man. We got this one joint called The Book of Barry. Which is a, a Barry White remake, man. That's bananas and shit, man. So, you know, brothers is working, brothers is at it. E Rule is back on it again, man. He's been in the cut working on some new stuff, cause you know he's the he's the West Coast best secret right there, man. You know he's E Rule's a beast out of his mouth, a beast. The song, the music, what's it called? Musical. The musical. The musical. Is a, is a guest on there? Is that credit? That's King Born. Okay. That's King. We never really credited him on it, but the guy that's rhyming on the musical I is King I thought so, Moore. but I wasn't sure. Okay, yeah, okay. That, that was an odd thing because we was messing around with the ideas because we wanted to do a concept eventually where we did a song called Vice Versa, where he rhymed and I DJed. So, and that was spawned from us doing the musical, you know, and that's who, who spit out on that. But the special joints on the Movement X album uh, that was my personal favorites, I did with Mathematics was was a cold hearted song, man. Big up to Lauren Chaney who produced that, man. That was real ill. Um, coming at you, I enjoyed it a lot. Like all the beef, it was some stuff on there that we was forced to do, like the uh, environmental song, Universal Blues. You know, that was an odd thing, but a lot of people clung to that because nobody hip hop artists had ever did any environmental music and stuff, man. So I wasn't too gun ho about doing it, but I did it nonetheless. It's well done though. Yeah. Yeah, for what it is, it wasn't corny. That was that'd be my main thing. It's like I love taking subjects that people won't do, but I can't do it corny. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people would do it and just to get it out of the way and it'd be so corny, but I kept it hip hop. You know what I'm saying? I start quoting the actual facts in there, how much land, how much water. I, I took it high five and said it was supposed to take it, you know. So but the standouts to me, like I said, the musical was one of them. Coming at you was one of my favorites. Is my mic on is one of my favorites, man. Uh I deal with mathematics. Um, yeah, those was like probably like my four like that I was really into. You know, Freedom Got a Shotgun was cool because we did the video and everything, man. That was like my first video. And that's back when videos was big productions and stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, having a winter bangle and it's being catered and all that stuff. I don't like to do that shit no more. Hobie's coming with the camera and somebody's going to carry these wires, Hobie, and we're going to hit up these locations and keep it pushing. Ain't nobody out there with no winter bangles and shit like that no more. That days is God. <laughs> But um, it was definitely a dope experience, man, to be able to do that, man, because, you know, I remember we got the t-shirts made with the 5% flag on it, with the flag on it, and I was able to give it to all my homies with the IG hats, because our crew was the Infinite Gods, which was us, the Now Kings, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of cats, Akbar at the time, uh, it was some crazy cats, man, Different all the different gods that rhymed, my king, even when we was all the IG posse, the infinite gods. <laughs> Akbar just based in Chicago? Uh, no, Akbar was a brother, um, they call him um, uh, Capital AK that was out of the good life. He was down with us back in those days, gotcha. man, Capital AK. All right. So that's also my favorite songs too. My other one, my other one was uh, Zigzag. Zigzag, 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 Zigzag. Yeah, that's Zigzag. another one I forgot about. Zigzag is Zigzag, definitely Zigzag. another favorite. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about Zigzag. Zigzag, Zig, dig. The map I have is complex as trig. Come take a swig because I'm strong as brandy. King drop the axe and I wax the fatty. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Me in the middle. I suffer Lord and Master Seven is the symbol. <laughs> I was styling on that one. Yeah, back in the day, man. Back in the day. Yeah, that was the joy. That's probably the only rock. I really remember off that album. <laughs>